YouTube has changed a lot since it first started. Back in the late 2000s, early 2010s, you could find yourself falling into a rabbit hole, following one recommended video after another, until you were deep in the weird part of YouTube. Strange videos with hardly any views that you'd watch at 2am and go, yeah, that's enough YouTube for one day. As the algorithm changed throughout the years, so did the rabbit holes. The right-wing pipeline gained prominence in 2017 after people discovered that YouTube was slowly pushing its viewers into more extreme content. It's a phenomenon that's been talked about to death. Like, literally, after all of the headlines and videos were made about it, YouTube changed the algorithm in a way so that when it senses you going down that path, it'll loop you back to your regularly scheduled programming. Literally talked about to death. Today, the weird part of YouTube is mainly relegated to rare gems that occasionally surface upon our collective feeds. Like this random Japanese video featuring Donkey Kong Country music. This checkpoint of the internet has people from all over the world opening up about their struggles in the comments. It's a really trippy video, and if you wanted to find more like this, well, you're SOL, or at the whims of the algorithm to see stuff like this. And it's kind of a shame, really. Like, minus the whole right-wing radicalization thing, the rabbit hole or pipeline, whatever you want to call them, it was a unique part of the YouTube experience that's just disappeared. Well, mostly disappeared. You see, YouTube's recommendation algorithm isn't the only thing that's changed. Over time, the platform has become increasingly corporatized. Big establishment media outlets are taking center stage over the homegrown talent, with the algorithm promoting traditional media over anything else. The moment Google bought the platform in 06, it's been finding ways to commercialize online video. So not only has the content gone corporate, but ads are everywhere. Pre-rolls, mid-rolls, end rolls, YouTube's even pushing ads on videos that aren't monetized. And it sucks. But the thing people don't really talk about is that YouTube itself is literally just ads. Like not just the ads themselves, but the content we skip those ads to see is mostly ads. Let me explain. You can largely split YouTube videos into two categories, experience oriented and product oriented. Experience videos are those you watch to experience something. Let's say a video essay to learn something new, a comedy skit to laugh, a music video to vibe, you get the idea. On the other hand, product videos are what they sound like. They're videos focused around a product. A video game playthrough, a tech review, or a makeup video. They largely center around products that you yourself can buy after watching a video. And these aren't clear-cut categories by any stretch of the imagination. Music videos can have product placement, a makeup video or a video game playthrough might be more about the comedy or the commentary than the product itself. But in the grand scheme, these distinctions don't matter too much. For now, let's put them aside and look at the top YouTube genres and see where they fit into these two categories. In the product category, we have beauty, gaming, tech, and fashion that solidly fit in this spot. I think these are all pretty self-explanatory as videos that revolve around things you can buy. Then we have some that are kind of on the fringe of the category. Genres like lifestyle, family, and vlogging channels incorporate products and sponsors as a big part of their content, but they're not solely focused on them, since forming a relationship with the creators over time and their commentary and comedy is a big part of that style of content too. So we'll leave these on the fringe. This leaves cooking, comedy, fitness, music, education, and art videos as the remaining categories for the experience category. And while these do focus on the experience, it doesn't take a lot of looking to see how products make their ways into these videos too. Fitness videos can focus on specific supplements and diet hacks, just like cooking and art videos can focus on supplies. Even genres like education can end up selling you an online class or a Skillshare subscription. Products are just everywhere on YouTube. Even Long Beach Griffey's 30 second skits are pushing Raycons. 
And if you think back to the old days of YouTube, it's pretty strange. I mean, really try to remember the videos you used to watch on YouTube 10 years ago. I don't remember watching a lot of product reviews, Amazon hauls, or videos that made me want to buy things, outside of video games, obviously. For the most part, we used to watch skits, comedy, animation. They were these strange, sometimes inexplicable creations filled with imagination and passion, whose purpose was to both entertain us and for the creators to express a part of themselves. It was YouTube. It was about broadcasting yourself. But over time, YouTube did become more corporate, partly by Google and the YouTube team, but also in part due to YouTubers. Once money became part of the equation, it was less about the art of expression and more about making careers out of online video. And I mean, I get it, don't get me wrong, anything to escape the rat race. But it seems like we lost something along the way. YouTube used to be something unique that stood on its own opposed to traditional media. But as it became commoditized, it became the media. To an extent that's genuinely mind-boggling. One single website rivals an entire established industry in viewership numbers. We are literally raising kids off of it. It's, it's an institution of modern media. And because of this, YouTube has grown to serve the very same function that traditional media has served for a long time, creating one of the most dangerous pipelines on the platform. In 2004, before YouTube, before the rise of social media, two researchers sought to examine the role media had on consumerist attitudes. It's a surprisingly difficult thing to measure. Mass media and consumerism are so ever-present that it's difficult to isolate the necessary variables to see its effects. But it's not ever-present everywhere. In places like 2004 China, where consumerism had been slowly emerging as its economy grew, the effect could be more carefully observed. Through their research, they concluded that urban Chinese residents who were more exposed to consumption-related and West-originated media were more likely to accept consumerist values. This study makes up one of many that studies the role of media on the changing global landscape. Studies on everywhere from Malaysia to Pakistan find that as Western media grows its influence, so does the adoption of consumerism. And I'm not saying the media is the cause of this, there's some deep global mechanisms at work here, but I do believe that it's a significant part in the spread of consumerism. Now, social media differs from traditional media in a lot of ways, but at its core, it serves the same purpose in spreading consumerist values. According to a report, consumers who are influenced by social media are four times more likely to spend more on purchases, which is huge. But YouTube isn't social media in the same way Facebook or Twitter are. YouTube's success is that it's a blend of traditional and social media, where you watch videos like if it's TV, but also grow attached to creators like if they were your friends. And that combination makes it even more dangerous. And there's no better example of this than our fringe categories, vlogging, family, and lifestyle. These are insidious in their blending of what's entertainment and what's advertising. Despite being categories that are supposed to be about the creator and their personality, they often devolve into showcases of hyper-consumerism. Haul videos, product showcases, just extravagant displays of wealth. Not only are they spreading consumerist values, they're doing so in a way that tricks you by providing that more personal element. For every product-oriented video, there'll be a personal vlog that makes you feel connected to the creator. And the natural consequences of having people consume this content since their childhoods is, well, not good. What research there is on the subject has found that people with higher levels of consumerist values are more likely to be depressed, anxious, have lower levels of self-esteem, and lower levels of life satisfaction. As Gen Zers continue to become adults in the next few years, we'll see the effects of this more and more. And that's not even to mention the disastrous effects of consumerism on the environment, making this an incredibly dangerous pipeline. 
the rabbit holes of the past have been replaced by a new, more insidious rabbit hole. One both ever present, yet invisible. The YouTube consumption rabbit hole slash pipeline. The name's in progress. It's one that starts by you watching videos on the internet and ends with you buying stuff that you wouldn't have bought otherwise. The timescale varies, you can watch one video, then buy a creator's merch, or you can adopt a hyper-consumerist mentality after watching YouTube over the span of a lifetime. Either way, its effects are hard to avoid, unless you watch YouTube to watch high-minded video essays. I'm kidding, don't forget to like and subscribe. This change in YouTube is why I think TikTok has seen such explosive growth. Don't get me wrong, products and consumerist values are huge on TikTok. The same kind of aspirational, product-oriented content on YouTube is on there. But the experience-oriented videos of old YouTube are just everywhere on TikTok. My feed is 99% fun skits, stories, and random things I wouldn't be able to find anywhere else on the internet. Sure, I can't find big brain, two hour long essays on there, but it's simple fun. Something YouTube used to be, and hope one day it can be again. Anyway, what do you guys think? Have you seen yourself fall down the YouTube consumption rabbit hole? Let me know in the comments down below.